On a brisk morning, a determined black woman was driving to a highly anticipated job interview. She was filled with excitement and nervous energy as she navigated her Ferrari 458 through the bustling city streets, skillfully cutting through traffic. This interview was not just an opportunity for her, it was a milestone she had been preparing for since receiving the invitation via email. The company she was aspiring to join was one of the most esteemed in the city. And she knew that securing a position there could significantly boost her career. As the first college graduate in her family, she felt a profound responsibility towards her parents, who had made countless sacrifices to ensure she received the best education possible. They had struggled financially and emotionally to support her and her siblings' education. Now, with a successful job, she hoped to relieve them of some of their burdens and contribute to her siblings' schooling. However, her anticipation quickly turned to anxiety when she noticed the flashing blue and red lights of a police car in her rearview mirror. Her heart sank as she wondered what she might have done wrong. She couldn't recall any traffic violations or mistakes while driving. With a deep breath, she pulled over, gripping the steering wheel tightly as the white police officer approached her vehicle. The officer instructed her to open the trunk of her car, nervously complying. She discreetly began recording the encounter, fearing what might transpire. Unbeknownst to her, this routine stop would take a shocking turn, potentially upheaving her life and the plans she had meticulously laid out for her future. As she stood by, her mind raced with thoughts of the interview she was about to miss and the repercussions it might have on her career aspirations and family responsibilities. Little did she know. This encounter was about to reveal something unexpected that could change everything in an instant. She changed lanes without signaling, but she quickly dismissed the idea of doing so recklessly because she knew it was more hassle than it was worth. Similarly, when it came to running red lights, she was far too cautious to engage in such behavior. That morning, she had diligently stopped at all three red lights she encountered, confident in her adherence to the rules of the road. She was utterly perplexed about why she might be pulled over, as she had not exceeded the speed limit and her car was in excellent condition. The only plausible reason she could think of was a routine stop and search. As she glanced in the rearview mirror, memories of distressing encounters between black individuals and police officers flooded her mind. The fear of becoming another statistic terrified her. Despite the flashing lights in her rearview, she initially pretended not to notice. Hoping to avoid any confrontation, however, when the patrol car's siren blared, she realized she could no longer ignore it without potentially being seen as fleeing from law enforcement, which would only complicate matters further. Reluctantly, she pulled over to the side of the road and turned off her engine. Using her side mirrors, she watched as the police car stopped a few paces behind her. A white police officer stepped out and adjusted his belt as he walked towards her vehicle. With each step he took, her heart raced faster, and her anxiety intensified. She was still convinced she hadn't done anything wrong, yet the sight of the white officer approaching filled her with dread, fearing he might harbor discriminatory attitudes. As the officer tapped gently on her window, signaling for her to roll it down, she took a moment to steady her trembling hands before complying, as she faced him, trying her best to appear calm and collected. She wondered if her nervous appearance made her look suspicious, though she knew that some officers didn't need much reason to act unfairly. The officer's name tag identified him as Officer Jenkins. He stared at her blankly as his eyes scanned the interior of her vehicle. She wondered what he was looking for and knew she had to keep the interaction as brief as possible, without waiting for him to speak. She prepared herself to address whatever concerns he might raise. Hoping the encounter would end swiftly and without incident, Jenkins, without uttering a single word, motioned towards the dashboard where Chinese was reaching for her documents. However, he signaled her to stop. It became clear he hadn't stopped her to check her papers. He had another concern. Chinese's hands paused over the dashboard as she turned to face him, puzzled about what could have warranted the stop since Jenkins had already clarified that it wasn't a routine check. Jenkins then explained that her brake lights were not functioning. He had been following her for some distance and observed that both lights were out, which was a violation of traffic laws. Chinese was taken aback by this revelation. She had just had those lights repaired less than a month prior and distinctly remembered the ordeal because it was quite costly. She recounted to Jenkins how the Firestone Warehouse, where she had the repairs done, had recommended a wire test to ensure everything was in order post-repair. However, Chinese hadn't pursued the wire test since it was priced steeply at $600, a significant amount for someone without a current job. 
she speculated that the high quote was perhaps because she was a woman driving a second-hand Ferrari. She loved flashy cars and had purchased the Ferrari when she was still employed in a well-paying job. She suspected the mechanics assumed she was wealthy and could afford high costs. Now, with the brake lights malfunctioning again, Chinese felt cheated, they likely hadn't repaired the lights properly because she declined the wire test, Chinese glanced apologetically at Jenkins, assuring him that she had indeed paid for the repairs and had no intention of deceiving anyone about such matters. She stressed her commitment to maintaining her vehicle's compliance with all regulations not just because she was meticulous and cautious, but also because of her deep affection for her car, she expressed her frustration over being exploited by untrustworthy mechanics. Jenkins listened intently, seemingly evaluating the sincerity of her words. After a moment of contemplation, he stepped back from the car and unexpectedly asked her to open the trunk, confused and a bit alarmed. Chinese questioned if she had misunderstood his request. It seemed unrelated to the brake light issue, and all she had anticipated was perhaps a ticket. As Jenkins repeated his demand firmly, anxiety washed over her, with a reluctant sigh, she complied and opened the trunk, an uneasy feeling of impending trouble weighing heavily on her, Chinese's fear of police officers was not unfounded, it was the result of years of absorbing stories about the treatment of black people by the police, particularly the experiences of young black individuals who were merely trying to improve their lives. However, her apprehension was not solely based on hearsay, she had a personal, distressing history involving an incident with white police officers, a few years prior, during what should have been a routine stop and search, Chinese's uncle was shot by a police officer despite the fact that he was found to carry nothing incriminating, the situation had escalated when her uncle resisted answering questions he perceived as unnecessary, leading to a heated verbal exchange. When he attempted to leave the scene in frustration, the officer shot him. This traumatic event had a profound impact on Chinese and her family, almost costing them a beloved family member. Although her uncle survived, he spent over a year recovering and faced ongoing health complications from the injury. It was only recently that he stopped needing frequent hospital visits, though he continued to undergo therapy. The incident not only altered her uncle's life but also left a lasting mark on their entire family. Since then, every member of Chinese's family harbored intense distrust towards the police system, particularly after seeing the officer who shot her uncle avoid any consequences. He had defended his actions by claiming he thought he saw her uncle reaching for a weapon, which prompted him to fire. The case was quickly dismissed. Reinforcing the family's deep-seated mistrust of the police and the justice system, to avoid any interactions with law enforcement, the family took meticulous care to abide by all laws, they never exceeded speed limits, ensured all their documents were in order, and always checked that their car was in good condition before hitting the road, they did everything within their power to minimize contact with the police. Chinese believed she had managed to navigate these challenges effectively. But she was mistaken. Despite her careful planning and the precautions she took, she still found herself in trouble. On the very day she was scheduled for an important interview, she was pulled over by the police. As Officer Jenkins instructed her to open her trunk, she felt a surge of bad luck, worse than usual, resigned. She complied but not before grabbing her phone from the cup holder, activating the camera, and switching it to video mode. She then cautiously opened her car door and followed the officer to the trunk documenting every moment of the interaction, as she sat in her car, she discreetly made sure that her recording device was running, capturing the interaction with Officer Jenkins, she couldn't shake the feeling that this moment was significant and warranted documentation, fearing she might regret it if she failed to capture it, to her astonishment, Jenkins did not approach her trunk as she had anticipated, instead, he focused on her brake lights, attempting to discern the cause of the malfunction, he spent several minutes inspecting and tinkering with them, his head half submerged in the trunk while she watched from the sidelines, a mixture of relief and surprise washing over her. Once Jenkins finished with the brake lights, he instructed her to pop the hood, she complied, and he quickly examined the engine, after a few moments, he stepped back, wiping his hands clean, and delivered some unwelcome news. The car's issues were serious and she had indeed been duped by a previous mechanic, she promised herself to address the repairs as soon as her interview was over, however, Jenkins expressed his concern about letting her drive without functioning brake lights, citing not only her safety but the safety of other road users as well, given her urgent appointment, 
he graciously offered to lead her to a nearby warehouse where she could get the lights fixed affordably and swiftly. He reassured her that it wasn't far, and she would still make her interview on time. Chinese gratefully followed him in her Ferrari, navigating through traffic. True to his word, the warehouse was just a short drive away. Upon arrival, the technicians quickly attended to her car, fixing both lights within 10 minutes at a cost significantly lower than what she had previously paid at Firestone, where the initial faulty repair had been made. She profusely thanked Jenkins for his unexpected assistance, he simply smiled, advising her to be more cautious in the future and mentioned that he would not issue a ticket as it was clear she was not at fault. With a wave, he returned to his patrol duties, elated and relieved, Chinese drove to her interview, arriving just in time, the positive outcome of her morning ordeal with Jenkins undoubtedly boosted her spirits, reflecting positively in her demeanor during the interview, afterward. As she drove home, she couldn't help but feel fortunate about how the day had turned out, especially her encounter with Officer Jenkins. She realized that she couldn't stop thinking about Officer Jenkins. She felt immensely grateful for the kindness he had shown her. She knew that he wasn't obligated to extend himself in the manner he did. He could have simply issued her a ticket and moved on. Instead, he chose to assist her. And for that, she was profoundly thankful, later that evening. As she settled into her bed, she pulled out her phone and began watching the video she had recorded earlier. The video captured everything the officer had done for her, knowing exactly what she wanted to do with it. She uploaded the video to Facebook, accompanying it with a lengthy post. In her post, she detailed how Officer Jenkins had gone above and beyond to help her, highlighting his kindness and selflessness. She praised him as a beacon of hope. A reason for people to have faith in the police force once more, as luck would have it, the post quickly went viral. Countless people watched the video repeatedly, and the likes and shares skyrocketed into the thousands within just a few days. Jenkins became a beloved figure, heralded by many who wanted his exemplary behavior to be known far and wide. As the post garnered widespread attention, the police station where Jenkins was stationed took notice. They responded to the viral content, thanking her for her kind words and affirming that Officer Jenkins was merely fulfilling his duty to protect and serve. They concluded their message by committing to continue working hard to make the community feel not only safe but also happy. This response only amplified the post's reach, captivating nearly everyone on the internet. Local news stations picked up the story, and soon, both she and Jenkins were invited to participate in interviews upon meeting at the studio. They embraced each other joyfully, neither having anticipated the significant attention their interaction would bring. Jenkins had never imagined that a simple act of assisting her with her car lights would thrust him into the spotlight. While she was equally surprised that her video had gone viral, it was a delightful turn of events, and they celebrated together after the interviews. During their conversation, she shared with Jenkins that she had secured the job she had interviewed for. Marking another triumph for her, Jenkins expressed his genuine happiness for her success, reflecting on the whole experience. She felt glad that everything had turned out so well, however, she harbored one regret. She had initially judged Jenkins harshly without truly knowing him, expecting the worst simply because she had been pulled over. This realization saddened her, and she wished she could take back those initial moments of doubt. The incident involving Jenkins served as a poignant reminder that not all law enforcement officers fall short of expectations. Indeed, many still earnestly uphold their commitments to serve and protect. Thanks to Jenkins' actions, her previous skepticism towards police officers diminished considerably. Moved by the experience, Chin's resolve to approach police officers with kindness and an open mind, refraining from passing judgment without truly understanding who they are. She also hoped that they would extend the same courtesy towards her. It's a heartwarming narrative. Who would have guessed Jenkins would go to such lengths for Chin's? What actions would you have taken if you were in her shoes? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. Next to give you another story, let's continue to see it. A woman pulled into a gas station, displaying behavior that caught the attention of the on-duty security guard, Clara. Stationed at his usual surveillance spot, was monitoring the gas pumps via security cameras, a typical aspect of his late afternoon shift. It had been a slow day, with the dullness nearly lulling him to sleep, until a sudden movement on one of the monitors jolted him awake. At pump number three, a woman dressed entirely in white, consisting of a jacket and matching shorts, was involved in suspicious activities. She wasn't filling up a vehicle but seemed to be meddling with something near the gas tank. 
Clara squinted, leaned closer to the monitor, and noticed she was holding a bright yellow plastic container, usually used to store gasoline for lawnmowers or generators. This was unusual, as people generally don't buy gasoline in containers at gas stations. As Clara watched more intently, he realized that the woman was not merely tinkering, she was actively filling the container with gasoline. Not the car parked next to her, her actions were quick and she appeared anxious, Clara suspected she might be stealing the gas, he reached for his radio to inform the attendant, but found it was not working, resolving to deal with the situation personally, Clara left the surveillance booth and walked towards the woman, excuse me, miss, can I assist you with anything, he called out, startled, the woman looked around nervously, saw Clara, quickly sealed the container, and hurried to her car. Before Clara could respond further, she ignited the engine and drove away swiftly into the street. As he watched the car vanish, Clara frowned, puzzled by her actions. Stealing a few gallons of gas wouldn't take her very far these days, he thought. Shaking his head in confusion, he returned to his post. Back in the cramped security booth, Clara reviewed the footage, trying to understand the woman's actions. Despite scrutinizing the video, nothing seemed to make sense. He placed the radio gently on the table and reclined in his chair, yet he couldn't shake the persistent sense that something was wrong. His gaze was fixed on the area where the woman had vanished. Just as he was ready to chalk it up to his imagination, something caught his attention. A security camera showed the woman reappearing briefly, now without the car. She stooped beside another pump, tampering with a slender hose, as Clara monitored the activity at the gas station. He silently vowed to remain vigilant. He stood there for a moment, catching his breath, his mind racing with determination. Something unusual caught Clara's attention. A woman seemed to be extracting the remaining fuel from a gas pump's nozzle. Upon closer inspection, Clara realized she was siphoning gas, which caused his blood pressure to skyrocket in anger. This was clearly not an accidental act. The woman was intentionally stealing fuel, determined to stop her. Clara sprinted from his booth and across the forecourt of the station. As he got closer, he shouted authoritatively, Hey, you at pump two, stop what you're doing right now. Startled, the woman quickly pulled the hose out of the pump and fled, skillfully dodging between the parked cars with surprising speed. Annoyed, Clara slammed his radio down. Despite his attempt to stop her, she had disappeared as quickly as she had appeared, remaining alert. Clara went back to his booth to keep an eye on the security cameras. Astonishingly, within minutes, the woman returned, this time stealthily inserting a thin tube into the gas tank of another vehicle, determined not to let her slip through his fingers again. Clara leaped out of his booth with a surge of resolve. He was set on apprehending her mid-mischief, spotting him. However, she instantly accelerated into a sprint, her speed astonishing, as she once again managed to dodge his grasp. Clara pursued her relentlessly to the fringe of the parking area. But by the time he spilled onto the adjacent road, she had evaporated into thin air. She had dashed across the lot and melted away into the dimness lurking behind the gas station. Gasping for air and grappling with confusion, Clara stood rooted to the spot in sheer bewilderment. What on earth was unfolding? His resolve hardened. He refused to throw in the towel, with a renewed sense of purpose. He returned to the sanctuary of his booth, his eyes now glued to the surveillance monitor with an unwavering intensity. To his growing frustration, there she was again on the screen, this time tampering with another unsuspecting patron's vehicle, attempting to siphon gasoline with a makeshift tube. This had to be stopped, with a mixture of urgency and anger tightening his voice. Clara snatched up the radio, security to attendant. Virgin, we have a gas thief at pump number three. I need backup immediately, he bolted outside yet again, his determination burning brighter than before to end her spree. However, history repeated itself. At the sound of Clara's determined shouts and the sight of his advancing figure, she bolted like a deer caught in headlights. Clara gave chase, weaving between the parked cars, his legs pushing their limits, yet her pace was relentless, winded and exasperated. He could only watch as she faded into the urban landscape once more. Her figure becoming just another shadow among the city's nocturnal life. Feeling defeated yet resolute, Clara hurried outside. He scanned the parking lot. But the woman had vanished, he checked behind the building, his heart pounding, this was becoming ridiculous, Clara was determined to put an end to this persistent thievery, swearing to himself that he wouldn't give up, he stood there for a moment, catching his breath, his mind racing with determination. Muttering under his breath his determination to apprehend her the next opportunity that arose, 
Clara briefly detected some movement by a row of stationary vehicles. By the time he reached the location, though, the woman had disappeared, panting and overcome with a sense of defeat. Clara trudged back to his post, this was the fourth instance he had been outsmarted by the shadowy figure he had dubbed the gas-guzzling ghost, yet, as he sank into his chair this time. A wave of tranquility washed over him, he concluded that chasing her relentlessly might not be the answer, resolute, he chose to sit and watch the security monitor intently as minutes turned into an hour, just as he was about to lose hope, she emerged on the monitor again, this time, Clara controlled his impulse. He observed calmly as she began to manipulate the fuel pump and fill an unusual vessel. A strategy began to form in his mind, as she carried on with her task. Clara quietly exited through the rear door, taking a shortcut via the employee-only area. He emerged through the front entrance just as she sealed her container, catching her by surprise. He dashed towards her, yelling, stop right there. His abrupt presence startled her, spinning around her expression one of shock, likely not expecting him to persist, she let go of the hose and, with a desperate shout, darted past Clara across the parking lot, yet, her fortune was about to change. The pursuit resumed, and Clara was closer than before, he intercepted her just before she could dart between the parked vehicles, forcing her to alter her path, stop, Clara shouted, urgency coloring his voice, he was uncertain of her motives, but the gas container she clutched in her frenzied escape triggered alarms in his mind. Was she siphoning gas to sell on the underground market, or perhaps, was she plotting an act of arson? Despite his fatigue, Clara pressed on. He couldn't allow her to disappear again with what could be a hazardous substance. The woman was remarkably nimble, weaving through the cars. Her slight build made her a difficult target. She was heading towards a group of rundown buildings in a neglected part of the city when her luck finally expired. As her foot caught on a crack in the pavement, she stumbled and fell, letting out a yelp of pain. She lost her grip on the container, which crashed to the ground, spilling gasoline all around. As Clara hurried over, his initial anger softened into concern. He crouched next to the woman, who was now cradling her arm and moaning softly, helping her to sit up. He noticed she was more focused on the spilled gasoline than on her evident injury indicating her concern lay more with the lost fuel than with her possibly injured arm. Then, Clara spotted a faded sticker on the battered container reading Life Support Machine, sparking his curiosity. Life Support, he inquired softly. Looking around, the gas station was in a desolate part of town, dotted with dilapidated houses that were often enveloped in darkness. He glanced up at the decrepit building the woman had been heading toward, aware that the area was known for frequent power outages. He pointed to the decrepit building and inquired if someone there needed the gas, looking up at him with eyes filled with desperation. Her response was about to change everything. As she began to speak, tears started to flow. She disclosed to Clara that her son required the gasoline to keep his life support machine running. Clara was still piecing together the situation. A child's life hinged on pilfered gasoline for a life support system. It didn't seem to make sense. He reluctantly followed her gaze toward the darkened buildings particularly one with a single flickering light indicating where her son was. She confirmed this, dabbing at her tears with a shaky hand as she gestured towards the gas containers. She detailed that her son relied on the gasoline for his machine, crucial during the frequent power outages, as she couldn't afford to purchase gasoline herself. Clara's jaw dropped, a machine powered by gasoline seemed extremely hazardous, yet the terror in the woman's eyes was telling, with caution. He moved closer to the building and peered through its grimy window. Inside, Clara saw a small boy lying in a bed, a critically ill child connected to a large machine by a network of tubes. Any initial anger Clara felt was replaced by relief. This wasn't a criminal act, but a mother's desperate attempt to save her son. He empathized deeply. His own daughter, Anna, was fighting cancer, and the constant dread of possibly losing her was a relentless presence, even amid escalating medical costs. He continued to strive to keep her alive. Clara turned to the woman and softly inquired about her son's situation. It was then that she shared her distressing tale. Her son, Daniel, had been struck with a severe heart failure. The doctors had informed her that a transplant was necessary, though there was no certainty he would even be placed on the transplant waiting list due to their lack of insurance, and the list itself was painfully lengthy. They offered little hope, indicating that without the transplant, his body would not hold up. Clara didn't wait for her to finish to grasp the full extent of her dilemma. He saw his own fears mirrored in her tearful eyes. 
Daniel's mother had managed to acquire an ECMO, a home-based life support system, to maintain her son's life given his critical condition, yet, their home suffered from frequent power outages, critically endangering Daniel's life, in a desperate effort to keep the life support running. She had turned to using gasoline in a makeshift generator she had assembled from scraps. It was a risky setup. Driven by a mother's undying love and the terrifying prospect of losing her son, upon arriving, Clara glanced at the gasoline container and fully understood the direness of the situation. He noticed the makeshift generator, crudely run on siphon gas, and he felt the deep fear and helplessness that overwhelmed the parent when their child is gravely ill. The generator was basic and unreliable, often failing but it was all she had, the life machine was the fragile lifeline keeping her son alive, and she was resolute in her decision not to let him go. Despite the financial hardships that had drained every penny she possessed, as Clara observed the woman bury her face in her hands, overwhelmed with emotion, his initial feelings of anger and confusion shifted to profound empathy, he knelt beside her, offered solace, and shared his empathy, he was acutely aware that a parent would go to any lengths for their child's health often disregarding logic and even the law at times. Nevertheless, he also highlighted the risks. The makeshift generator was in poor condition, and the fumes it emitted could easily ignite a fire. The woman admitted to Clara that she had depleted all her resources. She had borrowed as much as she could to maintain necessary life support systems. This move ensured that her son would receive the proper medical care he desperately needed without compromising their custodial situation. The woman was deeply relieved and grateful for the intervention that preserved her family's unity. Clara felt a deep empathy standing next to a mother forced into such drastic measures. Aware of the urgency, he pulled out his mobile phone, suggesting that contacting the police or an ambulance might be the first step towards a safer resolution. However, the woman's reaction was unexpected. She recoiled and knocked the phone from his hand, begging him not to alert anyone. She expressed her fear that the authorities would misjudge their precarious situation and possibly remove her son, placing him back in a hospital where inadequate life support facilities and financial limitations could jeopardize his well-being, understanding the fragility of their circumstances. Clara realized that depending on a risky generator and stolen gasoline was not a viable long-term solution. He could not live with himself if harm came to them, therefore, he assured her he would come back purchased a can of gasoline with his own funds, and vowed to seek a solution that would not threaten her son's welfare or custody. The woman expressed her gratitude and apologized for the inconvenience she had caused Clara, according to company rules. Clara was supposed to report the fuel theft immediately, yet, the thought of the woman's child, critically reliant on a life support system powered by the stolen gasoline, weighed heavily on him. At that moment, he could not bring himself to report to the authorities and chose to discuss the issue with his supervisor instead. Regrettably, Clara's regular supervisor was a strict adherent to regulations, unlikely to consider any mitigating factors, anxious. Clara awaited his shift change for the more sympathetic supervisor, Sarah, to take charge. Upon her arrival, Clara detailed the entire ordeal, the chase, the woman's tearful admission, and the dire situation concerning her son, anxiously. He awaited Sarah's response. To Clara's relief, Sarah reacted with empathy rather than reprimand. She decided to delay involving the police and immediately acted by summoning an ambulance for the woman's injured arm and contacting social services to address the family's crisis. The next morning, when the police were involved, it was not to apprehend the woman but to facilitate additional support. Accompanied by a social worker, the officers were there to help. Arranging for the boy's transfer to a specialized hospital that was equipped with the necessary life support facilities. This intervention ensured that the boy received the care he needed while keeping the family together. The turn of events garnered local media attention, and the community quickly came to the support of Clara and her son. Contributions poured in to help with the boy's health care costs. A local business contributed a significant amount to ensure Clara's family had a stable home offering an apartment equipped with dependable power. Additionally, a benefactor provided a new backup generator. And a legal firm offered to help Clara manage her insurance requirements. This tremendous wave of community support also guaranteed regular medical appointments for her son at a renowned local hospital. Clara was touched by the community's reaction. His initial act of kindness had ignited a surge of generosity and support. As Clara got to know more about Clara and her challenges, he felt a deeper connection. Especially given his similar experiences, Clara had a daughter, Anna. 
who was fighting cancer. When he shared his story with Clara, she was deeply moved and proposed they visit Anna. Pleased and surprised by her suggestion, Clara organized the visit, hoping it would bring joy to both children. When Clara visited Anna, and the subsequent week when Clara took both his daughter and Clara to visit Daniel in the hospital, it was a heartening experience. Anna, despite her own severe condition, was brought in a special chair and her spirits were lifted when she saw Daniel. The children spent the afternoon exchanging stories and experiences, finding comfort in their mutual struggles. The bonds formed that day highlighted the significant effects of compassion and community support during tough times. Clara and Clara developed a deep bond through their shared experiences of the emotional challenges involved in caring for a critically ill child. They spent many weeks at the hospital with Daniel, an enthusiastic eight-year-old with a love for dinosaurs. During this period, Clara was hit with the news he had dreaded. His daughter Anna's health had worsened. Despite receiving the finest medical treatments available, her delicate body could no longer cope with the disease. Overcome with sorrow as his life seemed to unravel, Clara faced one of his darkest moments when Anna passed away. Before her passing, Anna expressed a selfless desire. She wished for her heart to be donated to Daniel, hoping to alleviate his suffering. Touched by his daughter's compassionate choice, Clara discussed the organ donation with Clara. When he relayed the news of the donation, Clara was deeply moved. Moved by their shared grief, an unexpected bond formed between them when they comforted each other. Clara shed tears as Clara disclosed the details of the organ donation, touched by his generosity, shortly thereafter. They were greeted with heartening news. The transplant was a perfect match and Daniel's heart operation was successful, leading to promising signs of recovery. Full of thanks, Clara reached out to Clara to express her gratitude for his actions and to acknowledge the gift from Anna that granted Daniel a second chance at life. Clara took solace in the knowledge that his daughter's heart was still beating within Daniel. As the months went by and Daniel's condition improved, Clara and Clara's relationship, initially rooted in mutual sorrow and empathy, grew into something more profound. Clara found comfort in Clara's resilience, which supported him through the anguish of losing Anna. Clara, in return, came to rely on Clara as a steadfast support during her anxious moments concerning Daniel's recuperation. One evening, while at the hospital holding Clara's hand, they both realized they were destined to be together. Their journey, which began amidst the uncertainty and fear at a gas station, had evolved into a beautiful affirmation of the strength of compassion. It demonstrated how understanding and a single act of kindness could extend outward, saving lives and fostering new beginnings. What a tale! What are your thoughts on assisting individuals with life support challenges? Please share your views in the comments. That's all for today's story. Please subscribe and give a thumb up. See you next time.